Okay. As much as I can see, everybody have uh, also the audio connected. So welcome everybody to this first uh, open air uh, graph community call. Uh, we are happy to see how many people are interested in uh, uh, our uh, uh, community. Uh, so for today, what we are asking is uh, to uh, mute uh, during the presentation and then we will have uh, um, about 30 minutes of uh, discussion uh, for you to ask questions. Please uh, drop your questions uh, in the chat and uh, we will uh, um, moderate and uh, give you also the floor if uh, you would like to speak. Uh, so for today we have uh, uh, Paolo Mangi, who is basically the father of the open air graph uh, to introduce you uh, what is the graph and why we are starting this community call. Um, okay, so Paolo, the floor is yours. Good morning, everybody. I hope you can hear me. Uh, let me start by sharing the screen. Can you see it? Yes. Yes, all good. Okay. And it's presentation mode, right? Yes. Okay. Good. So good morning. Thank you for being here. Uh, I will try to introduce uh, the work that we're doing behind the Open Graph uh, to the extent that we are doing it today and where we started from. And uh, in fact, the reasons uh, the reason behind this community calls is also to understand how we can collaborate uh, to improve uh, its quality and its production because the graph, after all is uh, uh, ours uh, as a community, as a whole. So let me start from the basics. Uh, there's a new term that is going on, scientific knowledge graph, and it's been there for a while now, also adopted by the commission in recent calls, scholarly knowledge graphs, scientific knowledge graphs, we don't know yet what's the right one, but SKGs in the end is the uh, acronym that is being used. And the open, air, the open air graph is just exactly one of those. So it's a collection of metadata, metadata describing uh, entities that are common in the research life cycle, together with the relationships among them, which we use uh, to detect uh, relationships and understand how these objects are connected from organizations, grants, uh, publications, and as we know in open science, also resource data and resource software. So the aim of the graph is to be open as much as possible to the extent of CC0 and CC BY where, where possible, because in some subsets we have um, uh, still open, but some limitation uh, from our metadata providers. It has to be complete, which means that we're trying to collect from all sources that are pertinent to science. Uh, again, we are dealing with data and software uh, at the same league as with publications. So we are not focused on publications alone. Uh, we want it to be the duplicated, and we know why, because we're collecting descriptions, so metadata records about the same objects from different uh, data sources, so we need to duplicate those. We want it to be transparent, and uh, so we want to know uh, where the data comes from, uh, if we collect it from a specific source, or if we infer it through a method or through an algorithm, we want to track uh, where the data comes from. And we also want our consumers to know that, so they can... Uh, knowledgeably reuse the data. Then it's participatory, and this is uh, one of the reasons of the community calls in the, in the sense that we want communities to take on board the graph, uh, care about it, tell us where we're wrong, uh, contribute with the research results. This has been the case already in many scenarios. We have external collaborators that are helping us at improving the overall quality. We, we want it to be decentralized in the sense that the graph is here, but we want the data that we collect to be returned to the original sources. And we have mechanisms for that, which would not be described today, but mechanisms that can deliver the metadata that we infer and that is missing on a specific data source to the data source uh, for the purpose of enriching the local collection, where presumably in a repository can be persisted forever. Okay, that's very important. And we want it to be trusted. Again, one of the reasons here to uh, engage with the communities uh, is exactly that. So we want the people to trust the graph, to contribute to the graph with trusted data. That's the other important thing. Um, so it's a data, it's, it's a data uh, collection, a big data collection, which requires uh, uh, quite uh, 
uh, resource consuming data backbone. Okay, uh, it's a scientific knowledge graph. We know that, but at the same time, we need to comply with uh, some basic requirements, which is for which are, for example, the the fact that we need to have to represent a snapshot of the whole. Uh, research outcomes globally, worldwide, in a specific moment. So we need to be uh, to, to collect a comprehensive coverage and to make sure that this makes sense. And for that, we try to deliver a monthly update. Uh, we want to go through rigorous and transparent, as I mentioned before, cleaning the duplication and enrichment phases, which are critical. Uh, we have full text mining. We have uh, artificial intelligence to, let's say, compensate the lack of quality of metadata or completeness or accuracy of metadata where this is possible. Um, and of course, we make it run on a professional infrastructure, which is located in uh, Poland, ICM. Uh, it's a known data center uh, in Europe. Um, why we want to do it? Because uh, this was something that was missing. So, well, it, it's something that, others uh, as well are doing because this is what the open science community would like to do. So it's to build open data collections on top of which we can transparently build uh, services that can be useful for science, uh, discovery services, monitoring services. And for that, we need to track science and we need to track it using open data as much as possible because we don't want to have vendor lock-in experiences that we are still suffering from uh, so far. So we need to build these collections. And uh, what was missing there, and this is why we wanted to build the open air graph, is something that uh, it's a big collection of open data collection that goes beyond uh, publications, that tracks publications as other collections are doing. In some cases, we take advantage of exchanging data with these other SKGs uh, out there. I can mention many from Crossref, DataSite. Um, uh, we have research uh, graph from uh, Australia. Uh, and many others in Europe, even at the national level, like Chris systems, because de facto they are graphs uh, of information. So we track science in an open way, we interconnect it, we further clean it, and then we uh, offer this data for the purpose of uh, discovery and monitoring mechanisms, which are critical for science in terms of the developments, developments, but also in terms of its planning. So monitoring is really important for planning and evaluation. So this is the model, uh, bird view of the model. As you can see, we have products which contain indicators. Products are publications, data, software, and other products in the sense they cannot be classified in one of the three above. Um, there can be many relationships between these products from citations, versions, supplement to, et cetera. We have persons which are uh, in, related with products in many ways, mainly as authorships represented with ORCID identifiers. And then we have organizations, projects, sources, and funders uh, connected with the projects. Okay, All this graph is built and be made available uh, to the world. So special features, we embed indicators. So that's one important thing. So we collect indicators that can be useful for science also from other services. And this is where collaboration comes from. We collect APCs at the level of the persistent identifiers. We collect counter metrics like uh, downloads and views for publications, data, and software. We collect other popularity metrics from BIP. Uh, we uh, actually calculate citations because we collect the actual citation links and we produce, we are producer of citation links uh, through coaching. So the overall collection allows us to build indicators that we attach to the individual uh, objects. We are very flexible with respect to persistent identifiers. We adopt uh, all the ones that are known out there and uh, the community care, care about, including accession numbers like uh, uh, PDBs, uh, et cetera. Uh, and we do that for all sorts of uh, products, so publications, data, and software. And we keep stable identifiers which based on a stateless approach. So we generate IDs that depend on the original uh, identifiers, and we produce the ones that are stable uh, with respect to this in turn. These are the numbers that we are uh, calculating today after the duplication, because the total number of records that we collect is close to uh, uh, half a million, 500, uh, um, uh, no, sorry, <laughs> half a billion, 500 millions we collect. And as a result, we have uh, the numbers that you can see here. So 173 publications, almost 400,000 software, 60 million research data, 
80 million of other resource products, which cannot be classified again as the first three. We have 168 funders, 30 of which are providing us uh, grants data and 3.4 grants uh, together with 200,000 uh, 200, organizations. Uh, in terms of links, we have uh, quite a big amount. So uh, we are very much aligned with uh, all the known databases out there in terms of publications, you know, of citations. We are just adding some more on top because we infer ourselves publications from PDFs. Uh, but on top of that, we have close to 80 million publication data links, which are very important for uh, open science indicators, as well as 400,000 publication software links. As you can see, we also infer quite a lot of uh, links to grants so close to 5 million for publications, 1 million for data, and 700,000 for publications and grants. We work a lot on affiliations and data organization links and so on because of the final objectives of producing monitoring uh, information and monitoring statistics for organizations and funders where uh, this is possible. Um, these are the kind of data sources that are contributing to the graph. So it, what is uh, quite unique about the work that we are doing is that we uh, are collecting from 2,200 uh, uh, data sources, and we are trying to enter the world of the communities, the scientific communities in Europe and beyond. So we are collecting from re resource data repositories specific to certain um, communities, but also specific to some uh, countries. Um, at the same time, we are taking a look at the software universe. So we have a closed embedding and integration with software heritage. Uh, we integrate uh, with other databases out there, uh, like uh, the EGI application database, the GitHub itself. And we, of course, care about existing large collections like on paywall, open citations, uh, Microsoft, uh, and so on. We have the usual suspects. So the thematic repositories like Archive, PubMed, HAL, Repack, and we tend to be very flexible uh, on that respect. So we can, of course, include others uh, in the future. So the number of data sources is growing. But most importantly, we care about repositories. So um, we have an approach that goes towards the institutional uh, uh, and repositories and the organizations behind them. We, we really care about uh, uh, repositories. We have built a network around it. We have built guidelines that are trying to align the way repositories can export the metadata to contribute to this uh, graph and to other graphs uh, uh, in Europe. Um, we call this the onboarded data sources. So these are data sources that are compliant to the guidelines that we provide. They're close to a thousand uh, and uh, beyond at the moment. Uh, the guidelines are built uh, by the community itself. So we have a group and a community around it that updates the, the guidelines, make sure that these are implemented by repository platforms so that uh, repository managers can find them out of the box uh, in their technologies. And through these repositories, we collect metadata that is aligned uh, to what today is called also the European Open Science Cloud which of course adopted as one of the uh, standard uh, for repositories to export the metadata, the open air guidelines themselves. They're not the, unique, the, the only ones, but these are one of the tools that are to be used. And then we have, as I mentioned, what we call the instrumental data sources. These are very typical uh, in uh, many SKGs out there, uh, Dimensions, uh, uh, OpenAlex, uh, uh, Scopus itself. So we collect from the very large data sources, which are not necessarily compliant to the open air guidelines, but that are critical to build a graph like ours. And these include Crossref, Datasite, uh, PubMed, Archive, uh, Open Citations, the OIJ, uh, and then the registries. Of course, we care a lot about the registries because we want to be aligned and interconnected with the scholarly communication out there. So we have ORCID from which we collect not only person, person's data, but also the works behind it and which we enrich a lot. We are ORCID members. So connecting to the open air portals, you can uh, enrich your ORCID profile through the uh, tools that we are making, we are making available. But ORCID uh, is actually enriched by our work because through the graph, we can uh, extend uh, the um, the range of objects that are connected to specific ORCID identifiers, thanks to uh, inference techniques and so on. So we go through, a, a, let's say, a prompt suggestion uh, process. Um, as you can see, we have many data source, 
registries, uh, the ones adopted by the community, open door, fair sharing, Rethri data, also the EOSC service catalog, which has been lately uh, in, added to the list. And here we deduplicate them. So we are bringing also this useful uh, view of common profiles for, uh, um, for data sources across different registries, uh, which is useful to the EOSC, but also useful to uh, all of you and the community, of course. So briefly, uh, the graph is basically built by aggregating a quite large number of data sources. Some of them are compatible, actually, uh, the majority of them are compatible with the open air interoperability guidelines, uh, thanks to this community-driven approach that led us to, uh, uh, led us the guideline to be implemented across Europe and in the platforms. So that helps a lot in uh, our uh, aggregation process. But on top of that, we have, again, national, thematic, and community um, uh, data sources that are connected, so onboarding, registering to, to the open air graph that we aggregate. This aggregation uh, of data, which uh, is not yet uh, deduplicated, is then enriched by mining. So we collect PDFs where this is possible. We are close to 25 million at the moment. And we have a dedicated infrastructure to run full text mining, AI, and so on to enrich these objects. For each PDF brings content to its own record. After that, we deduplicate. So we merge records that are describing the same entity, keeping provenance over the records from all the data sources that have contributed to it and building a richer record. Uh, then we also enrich by inference because now we have an interesting collection that connects the dots. So we can pass the information from one node to another. I'll give you an example. If I have a publication that is, supplement, uh, is supplemented by a data set and they have the very same authors and the, the publication has ORCID IDs, we can move the ORCID IDs to the uh, authors of the of the uh, data set, or we can pass the project funding the publication to the data set because they are part of the, ex the same experiment. And after that, we finalize the graph and send it out through APIs and dumps. Many users, we have uh, loads of users. I just mentioned a few here. We have researchers, of course, that use our data to perform the science and science of science, uh, bibliometrics, uh, this stuff. Uh, we have organizations that are using uh, uh, the data to perform monitoring and so on. We have funders that are doing the same, including the European Commission. And we have service providers like the EOSC, but Scopus and Springer, who are actually taking our data to uh, enrich uh, their own collections. We have very good collaborations based on MOUs with many publishers, through which we exchange PDFs, mining, and data to enrich uh, bilaterally our collections. Uh, yes, uh, that's, I don't know why it appeared, but we also have, of course, organizations like or, or like countries or uh, universities that are using the data for monitoring, and as I will show you later, for Ireland. Access to the graph through data sets in Zenodo, you can find many of them. Uh, there's a specific collection that is called Open Air Graph that you can have access to, and you will find different slices of the graph. So the whole graph, so you can collect the whole thing or subsets of it, which... Uh, in the years have been requested more and more by people. So we decided to expose uh, the single and individual data sets uh, for them to use. Access to the graph, of course, is also available through APIs. Here are the links, you can collect them, you can go there, uh, request the token and access the APIs as much as you want there. Open. For more, we have documentation. So uh, graphopenair.eu is the uh, site of the graph, but you can find documentation. So information about the data model, how the properties are exposed, the schemas that we use, um, the whole graph production workflows. You can also find all the publications, scientific publications that we've written about it. We're trying to be as transparent as possible. Um, please uh, tell us uh, if you have any questions or uh, requests or, uh, inquiries uh, through the uh, forum that we have uh, uh, lately provided uh, because we really care about the interaction and uh, improving our services and getting feedback on our mistakes. And just a quick uh, scroll of the features that we introduced last year. Now we have the fields of science and the sustainable development goals. So we are tagging uh, all the records with these uh, uh, very important topics uh, and tags. Uh, I think we have a coverage of 
245 million um, sustainable development goals linked to our uh, connections, which is uh, to our uh, product products, uh, which I think is a very relevant and important uh, result. And we did that thanks to an interaction with a, a couple of resource data centers uh, um, that actually contributed a lot in, uh, in, in this activity. Again, uh, as open air, we cannot, of course, we, have, we don't have the whole knowledge of the world. So we definitely need, because we really care about this, others to contribute to improve the quality of the graph and to make it more uh, trusted, okay? Uh, fields of science classification, I'm not going into the why and what uh, you know that, but it's very important uh, for a graph like this to have a uniform uh, interpretation in view of what science is, the research fields, the research topics. We picked the field of science because we we know that is uh, well adopted and widely adopted uh, out there. So we have implemented algorithms that follow up on very consistent research and uh, integrated and embedded that in our um, data provision chain. So applications, discovery and research assessment. So once we build the data, of course, we build this uh, large collection, uh, we can use it for many purposes. And one of them uh, is for sure discovery. So there, there are a few things that you can do through the open air portals. One is explore, which is a generic search interface on top of the whole graph through which you can search through the different kinds of entities, but also navigate between them and find information about the statistics uh, and so on uh, of the objects therein. If you log in through ORCID, of course, you can interact with your ORCID profile and enrich it with everything because in this, um, uh, in this gateway, you will find your publications, your data and your software, not only publications. Uh, we can do this also for the specific communities that are asking us to provide them with a gateway. And in that case, we have, let's say, a very meticulous approach. So we care about cutting out this, this carving out this, uh, this slice of the graph that pertains a certain uh, discipline. And we do that by uh, delivering very specific mining purposes, very specific criteria to, of inclusion and so on. Okay. St again, through the portals, um, you can also, when once you're logged in, uh, enrich the graph. So you can manually add links between uh, products, uh, so links that connect the different products, or also between links, or also between products and projects. For example, if you want to claim that your object is being uh, funded by a specific product. In the context of the communities, this process is validated by the administrator of the communities. So in the case of the digital humanities, for example, uh, there will be a team of people uh, validating your stuff. Monitor is really interesting. It's one of the things that excites a lot of researchers in the field because you have such a rich collection, such so many links around it, and you, have to, you can start coming up with indicators. Um, so what I suggest you to do is to visit uh, these two sites and take a look, monitor.openair.eu, observatory.openair.eu. In Monitor, you, you will find a lot of closed dashboard because monitoring is typically a private um, uh, matter for the community, for the organizations. But the European Commission one is open. As you can see, uh, we are producing already a wide number of indicators regarding fairness, regarding open scienceness, uh, and so on which are the outcome, of course, of processing the graph um, with uh, special and dedicated statistic databases. Um, recently, we uh, have started working uh, on a tender, and I want to mention this because it's a very uh, interesting um, uh, scenario that actually explains the reasons of these communities, uh, community calls as well, one of the main reasons. So what Ireland wanted to do is to uh, have access to uh, a, a, a dashboard through which they could monitor the overall production uh, of Irish universities, Irish repositories, uh, and so on, um, with an open science uh, lens on. Okay, so tracking again, uh, plan S, uh, evolution of open science, open access, uh, and so on. So we started doing this using the graph. And uh, what came up is a very interesting flow through which they can use the graph to produce these indicators. Uh, so they have a dashboard now, it's in pi it's a pilot mode, but uh, uh, it's visible, through which they can um, interpret uh, 
the data that they're producing from the different repositories and universities, and that comes, of course, also from Crossref and DataSite and all the data sources that I listed before, um, to understand how Ireland is doing, right? And of course, steer, steer decision making and so on. At the same time, we have established a workflow through which we can also detect the anomalies that we uh, uh, identify in the original data. Because again, the original data is not always published in a proper way, not always aligned to standards, not always curated properly as it should be. And we feed it back uh, to the original repositories so that over time they can improve the way they produce the data. They can also, in some cases, and possibly in the future, instruct scientists on how to behave when they publish, uh, what exactly they have to do. Because too, in too many cases, scientists are really left alone in this process. They act by common sense, and when we act by common sense, we are all right, right? Uh, but we are not aligned, and that causes problem in the final uh, data. So this virtual, let's say, life cycle is very interesting, and I think is what... Uh, uh, we should do in Europe and actually beyond to make sure we have a fully open data a scholarly communication rec record of high quality. Um, this is these are just a few screenshots of what uh, the Irish OS monitor uh, provides uh, from open access routes, fair planners, APCs, cross country uh, collaborations, etc. Number of citations, of course, uh, and you can dig in by university by a repository. You can see at the top RPO monitors. RFO monitors, also the funders from Ireland are being focused. So it's a one single shop for stop shop, but single entry point for uh, information about national monitoring. So the take home message here is that the graph is probably the largest in the sense of open science monitoring SKG out there. So coverage and quantity and size is actually important in some cases because we want to have an overall view of what is the production. So we care about publications. We have uh, all of them, but we also try to have all data sets where all is trusted by scientists. The data source is trusted by scientists. It follows and is integrated in their publishing workflows. The graph is open, of course. So that's one key element. It's transparent. Again, everything we do uh, is transparent in the processes and in the data itself, where we try to describe part of the process that has generated the data. Uh, it is a public good. So that's another very important thing. So, and by public good, I mean that the Open Air Graph is operated by AMCE, Open Air AMCE, that is a no profit based on membership from the community. So anybody who's a member of the uh, organization can contribute to the roadmap and steer the roadmap of the graph. Okay. So it is an entity that goes beyond the people, that goes beyond. Uh, the individual organizations. It's actually uh, a community effort. And that's very important. So it's like a highway in a, mean, okay, in, in a way. It's not the result of Paolo and uh, it can go on forever or the current team. Um, and that's a very important aspect. So we don't have a vendor looking. So there's a, a funder behind that is a public funder. Uh, and then uh, it is participatory. And again, we're going back to the reason why we're having these community calls. They're very important. So we welcome a contribution from communities, service providers, organizations. We establish relationships with them. We learn from each other. We exchange data and methods. To conclude, why community calls? Because there are many gaps that need to be uh, filled and problems that need to be addressed. Now I'm mentioning the, the three that came up to my mind when I wrote these slides. Probably there's more, but... One of, one of this is the interoperability issue. So we have protocols, models, metadata formats, and vocabularies that vary a lot, especially when you dive into the communities, okay? So it is extremely important to leverage on uh, organizations like the EOSC itself and uh, or open air working groups to come up with common ideas and alignment and solutions. So it is critical to do that. So uh, for example, uh, collaborating with the, repository platforms or the data source platforms like DSpace, uh, ePrints, Dataverse has enormously improved uh, the alignment uh, worldwide. 
And we can really count today on, in the majority of cases, of data sources that are already compliant to some basic structural requirements. Then, of course, we all know that there's something to be added on top because resource typing, vocabularies may change. But it's really important to move in that direction. So to align, have a common view and a common mindset. Otherwise, we can build these collections that are useful for all of us. There's, in general, a lack of standard publishing practices across disciplines. Uh, some disciplines are very mature. They know what they do. In other disciplines, scientists are just left alone. So they pick a repository here and there, and they choose what to do. And this results in many cases in incomplete metadata or inaccurate metadata. Uh, nobody has checked, in fact, if what the metadata is declaring is the truth or if there's a mistake. And when you build these kind of collections, on top of which you want to build research assessment, this may be an issue. Okay, Resource typing is an issue. So what is the resource data in a discipline is completely different from what it is in another discipline. And these decisions have to be taken at the discipline level, not at the central level from an organization like Open Air. So these interactions are critical. Um, any compensation technique, which is typically goes down to full text mining, artificial intelligence, uh, or feedbacking, as I mentioned before, in the Irish monitor, uh, the communities on how to behave in a way, are a huge, uh, well, require a huge amount of skills that cannot be uh, uh, gathered in one organization alone. So here is where the membership approach of Open Air comes handy because we have many organizations, research and data centers worldwide that can support and enrich what we do. But of course, we want to go beyond. So uh, the more we know, the better. Uh, I've recently exchanged idea with the, uh, uh, open Science uh, France Monitor. We exchange methods, we exchange uh, ways to uh, to perform some uh, mining, for example. These are the kind of things that we all need in an Open Science community. Okay. The graph is public good. Uh, and this is where the community uh, comes handy again. Uh, we're seeking collaborations because we want to enrich quality and coverage. So we want, of course, high quality data sources to join us, um, especially when they uh, can ensure a trusted uh, publishing life cycle where metadata is created, where the objects, uh, the products that are being published are trusted by the communities and by the data source itself. But we also want to integrate research and solid research results. Uh, for example, the experience we had with the uh, sustainable development goals has been extremely successful and we uh, love that. We did the whole visibility, of course, and we all gain out of it. Uh, end users' feedbacks are critical. Of course, we make errors, and of course, we need somebody to tell us, because when you produce such amounts of data, all the monitoring tools that we have, of course, are kind of driven by the fact that we know what we have to monitor. So we are investigating on potential anomalies and so on, and we find many, but many of them come from the end users, from the researchers, from the services, like uh, the experience we're having with Ireland, right? So we gain out of it by improving, improving the quality life cycle. Um, we care, of course, uh, about community expectations. So this is why we're asking you to ask, to use the forum, to tell us where you would like to go in the future, what you think is missing, what we could, how we could extend the graph to serve different use cases from today or something that we are completely missing uh, uh, from our view at the moment. And of course, we want to improve scholarly communication infrastructures and workflows. So we have we want to establish synergies with service providers, researchers, publishers, because we'd like to align on the way we publish data. And this uh, starts from the researchers themselves or who is acting or who is performing publishing on their behalf and uh, from the data sources themselves. So from the publishing venues that they should provide the right tooling to make sure uh, science is published uh, in a less burdened way and in a right way. Uh, the same holds for policy and for guidelines. So we uh, are building de facto a community uh, in open air where we're trying to align on common standards and idea. And we do this on several uh, fora. Okay, we have the EOSC, we have RDA, for example, the SKG interoperability framework we are building. Uh, because we want the graph itself to be uh, easily interconnected with other uh, uh, services and vice versa. And this is something that we can only establish together uh, as a community. So thank you for your attention. Uh, I'm now 
very happy to answer all your questions now and of course beyond. So once the uh, call is over, uh, I'd be happy to reply to your questions via email. Thank you. Uh, okay, so I'm I'm giving the floor first to the people that are raising here the hand. So Katya, go ahead. Hi, hello, good morning. Uh, thank you, Paulo. That was a brilliant talk. Thank you very much for that. Um, I was wondering, you emphasized a lot uh, the transparency beyond uh, or that underlies the open air research graph. I was wondering if uh, uh, you have published or if we have public, if there's public access to all the rules and guidelines that underlie the, all the inf inferences and the duplication rules that you have to build the graph. Yes, I mean, if you go to the, the to the uh, documentation side, you will find the description of those processes. Uh, we are very happy to also to share the software, and there's uh, also a couple of publications that come and try to explain what we're doing, because uh, especially the duplication in the context of the graph uh, has some uh, side notes that are not easy to address. Uh, for example, when you merge two nodes, you also have to merge the relationships the node has with other nodes, okay? Uh, these are things that we care, uh, we are taking care of, and they're described uh, in the publications. Uh, on the documentation, you find the general rules. Mm -hmm. In fact, there's going to be uh, soon, uh, like in a month, a refinement of those rules that we're going to publish um, together with another publication, because we want to explain exactly uh, the process. But yeah. you will find uh, a lot of it already in the documentation side. We will definitely take a look, but I was I was leaning to towards that last part of your answer. So the very specific decisions that have to be made when you are yes. enriching the record. Yes, uh, because that's uh, that's the details that uh, that yes, make yes, the, yes. the big difference. Um, it's true. Uh, this this is something that it, it's also not easy to write uh, because yeah. it changes. Uh, in, in many cases, but of course we can have a dedicated talk, uh, a dedicated chat on that. We are very happy to uh, to share. Okay, okay. The other question, and I I would have more questions, but I will finish with this. Is uh, I was wondering about the feedback loop that you were describing, whereby uh, you try to um, feed all the uh, enrichments that you do to the records to the data sources. How is that? actually done i mean do, okay. do you have already an experience with a big uptake of this uh, uh, information yes 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 this? we have uh, okay so first of all let's make a distinction between two uh, feedback uh, let's say flows one feedback is one uh, through which we uh, realize that there is something like in a data source that is not performed in performed in a nice way for example uh, authors are not properly described or there's a uh, quite huge number of mistakes made in providing this kind of information that rings a bell basically and so we go back there and say guys there's something wrong in here um, that's not the case for Ireland uh, but for example we had cases in the past with repositories that were exposing uh, 10 times the same metadata record okay so you just go there and tell them guys uh, please fix there's a technical issue in there then there's a second flow, which is the one that we implement through the broker service. Uh, the broker service, it's a service that basically uh, takes a look at the graph uh, from the point of view of one uh, data source. Uh, this data source is giving me 10 records, I assume, here just as an example. I look at these 10 records. Since I know how they were in their original form, I can, by subtraction, basically, uh, detect which are the enrichments that I provide, okay, as a graph. And I can send these enrichments at the level of the records to the original data source. So we have a mechanism through which uh, the data source manager can subscribe to specific enrichments. For example, tell me all the open access versions of the records that I have uh, and where they are located, the URLs, okay? And so we can send notifications of this or give me all the topics that I don't have or tell me if I have another title or tell me whatever, okay? So these are things that the repository managers can do. So if you go to provider, provide, sorry, .openair.eu and you are a repository manager, you can 
uh, configure the your notification settings. Uh, as to the first case, which is the one that we apply mostly to uh, to the case like Ireland, instead we are trying to detect uh, the uh, miss the misses, in fact, in the metadata that may compromise uh, proper monitoring. So if data sets come without a date or they come uh, with author strings that I cannot really uh, connect to an ORCID ID or there is no ROAR, for example, no ROAR identifier, but just a string telling me about the organization. These are things that we can detect and discuss with the repository managers on how to fix it. Okay. Uh, and this is actually very important because there's mm, some magic that you can do at the level of the graph with AI and mining, and whatever, but this will always reduce uh, a margin of error, right? And you need somebody to validate it. You're never sure enough and so on. Uh, so producing the right metadata is actually key and also instructing on how to provide it and why you should care about providing the right metadata. Because otherwise your institute or you will not get your reward as you should. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. So we have many questions. So Paolo tries to be brief in the answers. Okay. Um, I will. Uh, I would like to give the floor to uh, uh, Laura Barbot from Daria, um, who asked a question here in uh, in uh, the form. If uh, you can uh, turn on your microphone. Yes, I'm just moving because I'm not in a place where I can talk. Okay, um, all good. I wanted to know about the possibilities or investigations or uh, if it's an entry requirement, but uh, what about products that don't have identifiers in our environment? It exists. And I would like to know if they are, uh, if it's a strict kind of entry requirements uh, for, the, for the graph or if it's something that... Uh, you are also investigating, or it's something that you let to repositories, basically. Uh, no, no, we don't we don't care about uh, identifiers. Uh, what we so we of course we care. <laughs> so if we have persistent identifiers, we collect them and we also identify them with a specific scheme. But we also collect uh, from repositories that don't have a persistent identifier. Uh, they have local URLs. We count on the fact that these URLs are stable enough, though. Okay, because again, the open air graph is a picture of the outside world. So if you're migrating your data from one place to another and you change completely uh, your identifiers, then you will suffer from that in a way. So previous data will disappear, the new data will reappear. Okay, and we integrated in the workflows and so on, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, but the open air graph is completely agnostic of the existence of an identifier. If there is, we exploit it. Otherwise, we just go ahead. Thank you. Thanks. And uh, from uh, the registration form, we have also other uh, uh, questions like uh, how can be data sets, research publications integrated to Open Air Graph? Uh, well, all you have to do is to publish your data sets, uh, whatever, with software publication in a data source that is compliant with the, the Open Air guidelines as is integrated in the Open Air Graph. Then this will be happen automatically. In Europe, this actually comes uh, handy to many because if you publish in your institutional repository and the institutional repository is in open air, then uh, you can immediately report to the commission your results because the commission participant portal is integrated with the open air graph. They will also appear in Scopus, for example, if you have links between your publications and data that are nicely specified. People navigating Scopus, when clicking on the publication, will see your data sets because they're collected from the Open Air Graph. Thanks. Um, Maurice, would you like uh, to uh, speak? Because I've seen a lot of uh, comments and uh, questions here. So I would like you to ask directly to Paolo your questions. Well, thanks. Um, I think these uh, questions are very specialized, so perhaps uh, Paolo can answer them in the in the list. Um, uh, one of them is, is about uh, the links uh, between the relations. Uh, I saw the slide between about the relations between publications to publication, publications to data and projects, but I, I'm not seeing uh, relations between uh, affiliations and researchers and uh, publications and researchers. Is this, is this coming? 
uh, is this on the roadmap or was it just not in the presentation, but it's already there? No, no. Okay, so we have we have links between uh, publications and authors that are not reported here, of course, but we, we could, in principle, calculate them. We're not keeping uh, the link between uh, the author, the, the publication, the author, and the affiliation for that specific author in the application in the in the in the, in the publication. Okay, so we are instead let's say flattening those. So what we care is to know which are the organizations involved in the publications and which are the authors involved in the publications. Not exactly which author for which publication is involved in a, in a, in a publication. The reason is simple, is because this information in the majority of the cases is not provided, so it doesn't come handy, and it would be left empty in most cases. And since instead we know where the what the organization is and the uh, author is, that would complicate the representation in a record, if you think about it, right? So so basically, we decided to represent the two independently, and then we can always try to recombine those when this is possible, but uh, it's not so often happening. So I can go deep into the discussion if you want. It was really a pragmatic choice, most, yeah, most of the cases, yeah, because you it. don't really yeah. need that, right? You really need to know if the publication belongs to... Uh, uh, I don't know, CERN, and who is the author of the publication. But you don't really care uh, in terms of statistics and research assessment to know if the author was for CERN for this publication. And this is also a natural uh, expression of the fact that this information is not provided in many cases in the metadata. Well, we can discuss about that. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. Um, my second question, but I, I don't want to take up the space for other people who have also interesting questions, so. Okay. Uh, yeah, go on with the second questions and then we switch. Okay. <laughs> okay. So the second one is about, uh, I was triggered by, uh, by enriching, uh, by mining. Uh, so uh, we did participate with, uh, with Open Air on the on the SDGs. Uh, so it's it's a pretty good model, but we have also another model built with Open uh, with uh, um, uh, Aurora that is um, um, triggering a higher uh, recall, uh, but keeping um, the, the the precision somewhat similar. Um, so you get more more results uh, target labeling more public um, publications to to an SDG. Uh, without getting a false positives, but the the nice thing is that it is also multilingual. The model that we use, um, and uh, that is could be handy for uh, because in the European context there are many languages being used. Um, and I was wondering if if we, I mean, we we can we offer this this whole thing for free, uh, of course. And can can you put that as well? Um, as a se second labeling instrument into the graph, uh, for example, like uh, Open uh, Alex does right now. Yes. They use our model to, um, uh, to, yes, to reach their data. I think it is doable. Uh, okay, this is the kind of thing that you should discuss with, uh, with the team that is currently doing it. Now we have, uh, we had a collaboration with you and with the uh, Athena Resource Center, and uh, they are contributing with their uh, the AI models for that. Um, but of course, we'd be interested. Uh, it would be great actually to do it and check if there is no conflict uh, in, in the sense in the data production, of course, if the two models are aligned and if they can learn from each other, so if they can reach uh, uh, their, both their contributions. Um, what I know is that it's uh, very uh, resource consuming very much and we need gpus so we need to perform these kind of actions on a separate systems because there was no chance we can do it on our hdfs mm -hmm. and uh, uh inference uh let's say infrastructure that we have so we need a dedicated machinery for that so if you think this is possible uh and if you want to collaborate i think a connection can be established but i think we discussed that right mm -hmm. Um, I don't know, sort of, okay. uh, but then it's still, I guess. <laughs> okay, no, because I uh, because, because I had that. capacity GPU available, but but uh, the project ended, so now it's not. So <laughs> yeah, no, uh, that that is the issue with this kind of models that you need to uh, yeah. also make them sustainable over time. So uh, you you can take advantage in a specific period of some resources, and then what, right? So and we we need to think thoroughly about it. 
But uh, on That's our it. side, we found some solutions, so we may discuss this. Okay. Thanks. No, thank you, Maurice, as usual. Always a pleasure. Thank you both. Uh, I would like to leave the floor to Joao Mendes Moreira uh, with this question. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, I wonder if you have a public dashboard about uh, the quality of data that can help you uh, make the curation based, for instance, on a on a HOR or, a, or an ORCID. You can see the data that is missing and uh, suggest correction or stuff like that. And the other the other question is, if you have public APIs. Uh, for subject classification, I mean, uh, fields of science uh, or SDGs. Thank you. Okay, so uh, as to the first question, I'm not sure I fully understand what you mean. So, so you're you're claiming that so because we include ORCID data and raw data. Okay, so we are collecting their data in um, in full. So, and we are integrating into the graph. It's vice versa, that we are kind of enriching their databases with information they may miss, okay? Because we establish this connection between the researchers and ORCID, for example. And we also propagate ORCID IDs where they're not yet there today, okay? Because of the identification I, I, process. Sorry, uh, my question was about the quality of data that you can assess if you have a tool you mentioned Ireland, and you mentioned that they can see what data is missing. Do you have? Do we have a public uh, tool that we can also use oh, okay. to assess how the quality of the data and what is missing? Mm, no, so there's no. We don't have a tool that exactly does that, but we have, of course, all the portals through which you can search, browse, and verify the quality and you can send feedback. So the forum now is one very nice way of doing it, but we keep on receiving through the help desk requests of that kind. And that's very useful for us because we can detect if the damage uh, is one that we have produced because of our mistakes, or if it was uh, uh, to be blamed by the original data source, which is in many cases, unfortunately the case. Uh, mistyping is one of very common things. So, uh, people publish an object and they claim it's, I don't know, it's a, a data set, instead it's a software, okay? And then somebody at the end of the chain tells me, tells us, uh, but the graph claims that this is a data set, but it's a software. No, we didn't, right? So, and there's nothing that we can do uh, uh, to improve it in some cases, um, but it's uh, the way to go. We are, uh, I'm not sure I have the time to say that, but we have uh, in the roadmap in the next few months, um, the idea of implementing specific uh, a labeling system, basically, that allows us to tell if a record is missing information that is crucial, or if a record should include something else to be perfect, let's say, to be exactly according to open science expectations. For example, a software that is left alone with a title, one author, no URL to any repository, no link to any publication, is not something that we would like to include in the monitoring, okay? So it's something that is should high, ring, let's say, a warning to the author. So the idea is also, if we know the author, to, to let him, know, let him, her, them know uh, that uh, there's something wrong. And if they really care, they should do it. Uh, because the graph and all these systems that are relying on data, data coming from data sites, for example, SciVal itself from a severe, now um, suffers from the fact that typing is uh, mistaken. So think of supplementary material. Mm -hmm. People publish a publication together with the pictures and the pictures are published as data sets in Zenodo or in Figshare, okay? When you collect it, it sounds like the publication comes with a huge list of data sets that are extremely powerful and useful. They're pictures, right? The figures in the paper. So how can you detect these differences uh, is actually crucial because if you count them as part of your uh, monitoring and production of your university of your failing, right? So this kind of detection is something that we are uh, we really care about. And in the next months, 
we try to uh, implement uh, heuristics that detect this kind of anomalies, tag them properly, so you can build the right monitoring at least <laughs> as far as uh, our techniques are good. <laughs> but we'll see. So you should expect this before the summer in the uh, in beta. Okay, with regard to the APIs for subject classification. With regard to the APIs, uh, we have public APIs. I'm not sure we can search by SDGs. There's Claudio not and search, the last not, here. Not search is is for us to use and um, do our own classification based on the information we have. Okay, we are publishing it. So we are publishing as part of the graph, you have the information so you can collect it. Uh, I think you can, in some cases, download subsets. I'm not sure there's one for your university or for your country, uh, but these actually come together with a gateway. So if you have a gateway for your organization, you also have a, a subset of the data for your organization. Okay, uh, And the same comes from a monitoring of the country or a ministry or a funder. Uh, we, in general, don't generate the data sets on request because it's actually expensive <laughs> uh, to keep all these dumps. Uh, we are talking about uh, terabytes of data, right? And um, but we can discuss it offline. If you send me an email, we'll see. Okay. Maybe we can tell you how to easily uh, find what you need in the graph. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome, Joe. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Paolo and Joao. Uh, um, so here also in the chat uh, and uh, also in the registration form, uh, Jens. Uh, asked about uh, the plan for the citations number. Uh, Claudio answered that uh, we are currently have two billion citation links, mm -hmm. um, but um, maybe we can, uh, uh, okay, maybe we can uh, uh, give some kind of answer with our collaboration with open citations. Paolo? Mm, no, actually the citations are exactly the same that we have in open citations. Okay. So uh, they're actually we actually enrich open citations with some citations that we are inferring. So the publication publication is exactly the same number plus a little bit more that we are contributing. So we have we're fully integrated with uh, open citation. We integrate Kochi, and we also infer on top of that uh, citations from the publications PDFs that we have. Uh, so it's a sort of circle. So we are basically ingesting what we give them, but that's natural. Um, on top of that, we have the citations from publications and data, publications and software, the majority of which have been inferred because software is not, software publishing is still not a very uh, uh, spread, let's say, practice, and they don't do it in the proper way. So we mine the PDFs, we find the links to the software, we reificate a record for the software, and we build the link. So that's more a reference, like a mention, okay? Uh, we are not sure if it's a citation, uh, positive, negative, uh, if it's a supplement of, uh, but it's something that we can start from to run our investigations. One step that is still to be made is to understand what to do with the, with the citations, actually with the links that are coming from data site. Because we have publication, publication links in data sites. We also have publication data and publication software links in data sites. If to consider them citations or not is not clear, is something we're discussing with open citations. Um, that's because open citations has run uh, uh, an analysis by picking some key data sources that are part of data site, and they realize they have completely different practices. So some of them publish citations like references, and some publish citations like citations. So in the end, it's really hard to understand if a third party publishes a reference that is not a citation and make a distinction between these two. Uh, so we'll tr we, we at the moment, have decided to, de to treat all references for some data sources as citations. That complicates a lot the approach that we have in mind. But fortunately, there are not so many. I think they're kind of in the order of six millions, which compared to the two millions uh, uh, is nothing. Uh, okay, uh, so we will uh, answer to the other questions uh, offline, and uh, I would like to give the Billions. floor. Uh, sorry. Yes. Sorry, <laughs> I would like to give the floor to Elena with the last uh, communication, and uh, we will uh, um, 
we will uh, give uh, you the notes and answer in the notes uh, uh, document. So, Alena, the floor is yours. Hey, thank you. Okay, so I'd just like to take a minute to uh, announce to everyone uh, the new Open Air Graph website, uh, which is set to launch this week. So this is a new site. It's updated, an updated version of the last one. Um, it features new things such as the user form. This is the same one that Paolo mentioned earlier on. You can access the form from now, from today, but um, in the website, there will be links to the form as well. There will be an FAQ page and also a page that clearly uh, lays out how you in your respective role can use and contribute to the graph via the open air, uh, open air graph API data sets and over their open air services. So definitely check it out. Uh, you can see when the updated page will go live on our Twitter page. So that's here at open air graph. Um, this is a very new page as an open, very new from the past couple of days. So at this moment, if you go to now, it is empty, but we will soon be substantiating it with a lot of news about the graph developments, um, any developments in open science that also relate to, to the open air graph and uh, scientific knowledge graphs. So you can go there to see when the, the new page will be live and also just to keep up to date with any and all developments in the open air graph. So thank you. And also thanks again for everyone that uh, came today showing your interest. Um, this is really exciting for us, a new community call series, and we really look forward to all of our future discussions and hearing all your feedback. So thanks again, everyone. Thank you. And uh, we will have a follow-up via mail with you. Okay. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank thanks you. a lot for joining, everyone. Goodbye. See you at the next one. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.